people in law to be extended further. Trouble, you might think, could be brewing with religious groups. Senator Penny Wong says religious protections are a licence to discriminate. It's the same as saying we don't serve Jews, we don't serve blacks. Is it like that, or are there legitimate reasons why exemptions, in your opinion, should be granted? Um, I th- first and foremost, I think good on Australia for um, getting out and voting and voting the way that they did. What a huge vote that um, and, and engagement apparently was somewhere up in the eighty percent uh, of people who voted, and one of the biggest votes ever, not just on um, uh, on a referendum like this. But so um, you know, good on Australians for having their say. Um, for me, uh, I-, I would hate to see anything that allows people to discriminate. But then again, it's like. You have to have the choice, um, and if you, in my view, uh, you you should have a choice. Now, if you uh, want to go to the church and the church says no, um, surely you can find another one. Or um, I, I think that anything that uh, gives license to discriminate in legislation would be really poor. The grey area is alias where a cake maker, for example, refuses to bake a cake for a um, same-sex wedding, mm. and the argument is that that person isn't. A minister or a priest, that person offers a general service to the public and cannot refuse this request under law. Mm, and neither should they be allowed to. I totally agree. It's the thin edge of the wedge as soon as you start allowing that. And just because you don't agree with something for whatever reason, if you're in the service industry, suck it up. You shouldn't be in the service industry if you are closed-minded or controlled in any way about what you deliver. I, I take Scott's point about having the choice, but, boy, you could apply that to freedom of speech and some pretty awful things people say. I know you're not suggesting that, Scott, but I just think it's the skin, uh, the thin edge of the wedge and uh, I agree with um, Turnbull's position that it would be just a nightmare to see this um, allowed for in, in law. Liberal Senator James Patterson has put up an, a bill that would allow service providers to refuse to participate in a same-sex wedding if that goes against their beliefs. Uh, it would give people the right, not just men and women of the cloth, to conscientiously object and not participate. And lawyers say these are uncharted waters. You know, the happy couple want to stay at your Air- Airbnb. You say, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, and, I, and, and that's what I mean. And I think the service as well um, with Ali, it's, it would be anything that allows for that discrimination uh, would be wrong. Uh, and for um, a church... Um, look, I'm not somebody who goes to church, uh, so I can't speak on their behalf, but um, I can understand where they might stand on it, but uh, service industry, uh, absolutely not. Uh, it wouldn't matter whether you are um, Jew, whether you're black, whether you're Asian, whether you, whatever you are, um, left, right, whatever. If, if you said no to somebody based on the fact that just because of their beliefs, then that's wrong. It'll be interesting to see which way they go and uh, the various bills coming forth in the Australian Parliament. Uh, just as we leave, uh, not a big story, but a clean-up of Queenstown Bay has found bottle-top cigarette butts, straws, used condoms and, in particular, plastic spoons. Sea Shepherd coordinator Rob Dickinson and he and his team picked up the rubbish say it's disappointing so much waste is being discarded on the beach. I don't understand the mindset. Mm-hmm. Do you understand the mindset? No. <laughs> No, I don't either. I'd, um, boy, we've got to do better in getting our own people and visitors to, to only leave their footprints behind. It's not good enough. We've yeah. got a long way to go. Mm. Very good. Ali Jones, always a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Jim. And Scott Campbell, lovely to see you. Kia ora. Thank you. And we are back tomorrow. Thanks for your company, everybody. Guy Nespin is standing by now with Chick One. Mai mai, haere mai, piki mai, kāke mai, kei te whakaronga mai koe ki te reo, irarangi wa Aotearoa. Kia ora, good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Guy Nespina and this week for John Campbell on Checkpoint. Tonight, the Aussies say I do to same-sex marriage. We have all the reaction and we speak to the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott's sister, Christine, who hopes to be one of the first to walk down the aisle. The Revenue Minister Stuart Nash announces that New Zealanders will pay GST on internet shopping, but then he goes AWOL before giving us any of the details. There's speculation of a coup in Zimbabwe as soldiers and military vehicles are deployed right across the capital. And the Mayor of Whangarei urges young people to reach out for help following at least three suspected suicides in the city this week. Wellingtonians brace themselves for the biggest rail strike in more than 20 years.
RNZ News at 5. Kia ora, I'm Katrina Batten. The police are warning Wellington commuters there'll be massive increase in traffic tomorrow because of the train strike. Rail workers are stopping work for 24 hours in their first big strike in decades. The region's entire rail network will be shut down from 2 o'clock tomorrow morning. Wellington's road policing manager, Jan Craig, says roads will be congested and drivers will need to be sensible. She's asking people to be patient and considerate and to think about getting on the road earlier or later than usual. High school students facing exams in eight subjects for NCEA and scholarship will be among those affected by the strike. A deputy principal at Wellington High School, Karen Spencer, says she sought help for her students from the Qualifications Authority. We've been informed that students who cannot get to their exam centre will not get a derived grade and that emergency grades do not apply in this situation. But we have also been told that schools around the region, if they have room, can accept local students who might not be able to get into the city centre. Karen Spencer of Wellington High School. In an historic poll, Australians have overwhelmingly voted in favour of legalising same-sex marriage. The non-binding postal vote showed nearly 62% of people favour allowing same-sex couples to wed. The Australian opposition leader Bill Shorten says the survey result is hugely positive for the country. I believe in this survey Australians have voted for a generous view of themselves for a modern Australia where diversity is accepted, supported and respected. Bill Shorten. The police have made the South Island's biggest seizure of methamphetamine, 49 kilos of the drug, with an estimated street value of $50 million. The drugs arrived in Christchurch in an air freight consignment of safety lights sent from Mexico on November the 1st. The police say two Christchurch men aged 25 and 31 appeared in court today on charges of importing a Class A drug and possession of methamphetamine for supply. The National Party is questioning whether the Prime Minister has made any progress on convincing Australia to accept 150 refugees from offshore detention centres. Jacinda Ardern wrapped up the East Asia Summit with a conversation with her Australian counterpart Malcolm Turnbull about the situation on Manus Island. Here's our political editor Jane Patterson. New Zealand will give Papua New Guinea and aid agencies up to $3 million to help care for the refugees holed up in the decommissioned Manus Island camp where all of the facilities have been shut down. Officials will also start laying the groundwork for a screening process that can be quickly put in place if and when Australia accepts the offer. Ms Ardern says this marks more progress than has been made for many years. National says in the end it's still up to Australia to accept the offer or not. The international the National Red Cross says it's aware of the offer of aid money and would welcome any support. From Parliament, Jane Patterson. In Zimbabwe, explosions have rocked the centre of Harare and soldiers have seized the state broadcaster. Heavy gunfire and artillery have also been heard in northern suburbs, although the situation is unclear. It comes after the ruling ZANU-PF party accused the head of the military of treason, prompting speculation of a coup. General Constantino Chiwenga had warned the, Prime Min had warned the President, Robert Mugabe, that he was prepared to intervene to end a political purge after the Vice President was sacked. There was no word from the military as to the fate of the 93-year-old who's ruled Zimbabwe for the past 37 years. At the heart of the crisis is a power struggle over who will succeed Mr Mugabe as president. His wife Grace is currently the lead contender. A 12-month-old baby run over by a car in Whangamata had been playing just metres away from his parents. The infant was flown to Waikato Hospital where he's in a stable condition. Whangamata Sergeant Laura Beasley says a 34-year-old German tourist reversed over the baby on the driveway of, his backpack, of a backpacker's just after 9 o'clock this morning. He reversed out onto Beverly Terrace and as he reversed out he saw a baby lying on the ground um, convulsing and realised that he had reversed over this baby. Lara Beasley says the child's parents, who are also visiting from Germany, were having their breakfast about 15 metres away. She says they were very upset and the driver was extremely shaken. All are receiving victim support. It's five past five.
To sport and the All Whites say a fiercely partisan 50,000 strong crowd in Peru's National Stadium in Lima won't overwhelm them. New Zealand play the return leg of their World Cup qualifier against Peru tomorrow afternoon following the nil-all draw in Wellington at the weekend. A draw with goals scored would put the All Whites through while a loss would end their hopes of making it to Russia. Skipper Winston Reid though is confident his side won't succumb to the pressure. We play many of our games away from home and against good opponents, so uh, we're well travelled. So we're used to this, we're used to pressure, you know, we're used to going through this qualification route every fourth year. We have two important games really, so I'm sure you're going to see tomorrow a, a concentrated side. Winston Reid. Halfback Taweta Kerbalo says he's satisfied with what he's achieved after what was likely his last game for the All Blacks. The All Blacks beat a French selection 28-23 in Lyon this morning after trailing 15-14 at half-time. Being behind Aaron Smith and TJ Peronara on the half-back pecking order, he may not get to play in the final two tests of the year against Wales and Scotland. You know, I told myself I've, I've got a job to do and there's no use being an emotional wreck out there. You know, I've got to go and and do my mahi so uh, so we can so we can get the result we wanted. But obviously, uh, we'll see what happens later on in the tour. But um, proud moment, especially for my, my family. Tawera Kerbalo is moving to French club La Rochelle. That's the news. Tonight on nights, Paul Barker on New Zealand's role in the Palestine campaign. That's what it was called back then. Although ironically, what happened a hundred years ago paved the way for the modern state of Israel. Simon Morris reviews the Kenneth Branagh remake of Murder on the Orient Express, but how to maintain interest when we already know who did it from the previous version. And John Thornley celebrates the spiritual side of Dave Dobbin. A night's from after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow, northland to Whanganui, including Coromandel Bay of Plenty and the central high country. A few showers, especially inland and about the ranges, where some could be heavy and thundery with hail during the afternoon and evenings. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay mainly fine, but afternoon and evening showers about the ranges, some possibly heavy and thundery tomorrow. Manawatu to Wellington also widened up and mainly fine. Nelson, Buller and Westland, fine and cloudy periods with isolated afternoon and evening showers about the ranges. Marlborough, Canterbury, Otago and Southland, mainly fine. However, areas of cloud morning and evening and isolated showers about the Canterbury foothills and Kaikoura ranges tomorrow afternoon. Fiordland, fine today, cloudy periods tomorrow with showers in the south and for the Chatham Islands, a few light showers clearing tomorrow afternoon. It's coming up to eight past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks very much, Katrina, and thank you all for tuning in. Kia ora, good evening, and welcome to Checkpoint. I'm Guy and Espiner, in this week for John Campbell. Coming up, we'll all pay GST on online shopping, but where's the detail? And speculation of a coup in Zimbabwe. But let's begin tonight across the Tasman, where Australians have delivered the verdict, loudly directing the nation's leaders by the postal survey to legalise same-sex marriage. And with the news, yes, campaigners right across the country dissolved into tears, with the no supporters now looking to influence the legislation that will be needed. The headline number, 61.6 voted yes and 38.4% voted no. Still something like 4 million people voting against this. Pretty remarkable, really, the turnout here is a voluntary survey. Nearly 80% of eligible voters took part in this. In a moment, we'll hear something quite special from the former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott's sister, Christine. She's hoping to be one of the first people to walk down the aisle and say, I do, under this new legislation. But first, let's get a wrap-up of this from the ABC's Tom Eggleton. Truly a day in history. Chief Statistician David Kalish was the bearer of the news. His press conference was televised live on big screens at a series of rallies organised by the Yes campaign across major cities, including at Melbourne's State Library. Yes responses, 7,817,247, representing 61.6%. Within minutes, the Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull was on his feet in Canberra, having jetted in only three hours earlier from his tour of Asia. They voted yes for fairness. They voted yes for commitment. They voted yes for love. And now it is up to us, here in the Parliament of Australia, 
to get on with it. The postal survey had its critics, but Mr Turnbull says today's results are vindication of the process. We said we would give every Australian their say, and we did. Many people tried to stop us. Bill Shorten, prominent amongst them. He didn't want Australians to have their say, but thanks to the ABS survey and Matthias's very uh, skillful management of this process, every Australian had their say. 80% of them uh, chose to vote, and as we know, 61.6% .6 of them said yes. That is an overwhelming result. Elsewhere in Parliament, parties were held in offices to watch the result. Labor frontbencher Penny Wong, who's been at the forefront of the Yes campaign, buried her face in her hands, overcome with emotion. <laughs> Opposition leader Bill Shorten's in Melbourne today at that rally at the State Library. Yeah! His sentiments echoed those of the Prime Minister about the result of the survey. What a fabulous day to be an Australian because in this survey the Australian people have declared overwhelmingly Australia is ready for marriage equality. Like the Prime Minister, he says Parliament must now do its job. And I just want to make one promise. One promise. Today we celebrate. Tomorrow we legislate. There's grudging acceptance of the result from those who oppose same-sex marriage. Liberal Senator Eric Abett. Congratulations to the Yes uh, campaign. They've uh, won a clear victory, albeit slightly lower than the polls may have indicated, but nevertheless it is a, a very clear victory. And so I put out a statement headed, Regret but Respect. So I regret the decision of my fellow Australians, but the way our system works, you've got to respect it. But what exactly will be legislated is far from clear. A bill from pro-same-sex marriage Liberal Senator Dean Smith will be presented this afternoon to the Senate. He's been working on it since last year and is speaking today of his hope that it'll form the foundation of a future law legalising same-sex marriages. Uh, if there are amendments, let's see them. Let's see them early. But let's be very clear about this. Australians did not participate in a survey to have one discrimination plank removed, to have other planks of discrimination piled upon them. The Prime Minister swung his support behind Dean Smith's bill, though he's being careful not to be too confrontational with those in his party with their own ideas about how to proceed. So that is the overview there. Let's look now at one of those who is expected to be among the first to marry under this new legislation, and that is the sister of the former Australian Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, who, of course, was one of the chief opponents of same-sex marriage in Australia. Sydney City Councillor Christine Forster plans to marry her long-time partner, Virginia Edwards, in February next year. Christine Forster was in Sydney, uh, central Sydney, when the news came through. I spoke to her just a short time ago. She walked down Pitt Street in the centre of the city for a citizenship ceremony back at her office. Oh, yeah, look, it, it was amazing. You know, the people of Australia were asked to have their say. They were asked to participate in a process that most of us didn't really want, but really what they have done is they have said loudly and proudly that they want every Australian to have equal rights, uh, to have a fair go and to be able to marry the person they love and are committed to before, you know, under the law of this country. It's been a really, really special moment today. And I understand you're uh, walking through Sydney as we speak. How, how does it feel? Does it feel different? Look, uh, this is a, a better, fairer, um, kinder country than it was yesterday. And that is the reality. And you guys have been through that in New Zealand. You know how it feels. Uh, we have been waiting for this for a long time. And sadly, uh, politicians in Canberra have, you know, thrown curveballs at us repeatedly uh, over the last, particularly over the last four or five years. But today, uh, the people of Australia said yes. And <laughs> that is a fantastic feeling. And there is a groundswell of of emotion. Uh, people are relieved, they're happy, they're 
feeling like finally uh, they are acknowledged in this country. So it's been really special. OK, you've been speaking um, broadly there, but this is personal for you too, right? Um, you've been with your partner, Virginia, for some time. I think you got um, engaged, what, in 2013. What does this mean for you? Look, well, for us, you know, we're just a couple of old lesbians and it means for us that we can get married in February, which is what we were planning. But the more important thing is, Guy, to be honest, you know, for the Australians who are the age of our children, they can now look at this, uh, look at their futures, look at their lives and know that they have the same opportunities, they have the same rights, they have the same future as every other Australian. You know, kids of that generation uh, and all the generations behind them. And that's far more important than, than, as I say, a couple of old bags like Virginia and me. Uh, you know, it's important for us, but but it's more important for the rest of the of, of the young people of Australia who are coming up behind us, who will, as I say, have the same rights, opportunities, and privileges that that everybody else does. Absolutely. Um, you said you were planning to m marry in February. Uh, how, what was the original plan? It, look, we were always planning to get married in February. Uh, you know, in desperation, we decided at the start of this year that we should uh, uh, that I that I would renew my British passport because I'm a dual citizen, uh, and that we would get married in the British consulate because at that stage, at the start of this year, it didn't look like the Australian Parliament was going to move on on marriage equality. Uh, so we started planning our wedding for February under those. Uh, that was our plan B. It was a, sort of a desperate plan that we didn't want to that we didn't want to take, but uh, when it looked like nothing was going to happen for the foreseeable future, yeah. we, we did take that step, but um, then, you, you know, we were kind of happily overtaken by events and uh, the Australian Parliament moved on at least having this, holding this plebiscite and at least bringing it to a head and having the Australian people make a decision and the Australian people have made a decision and now it's up to the Parliament to respect that decision and to pass the legislation as quickly as possible. Tony Abbott, your, your brother has been one of the uh, most outspoken opponents of this, I guess. How has that been for you, managing um, that relationship and managing uh, that issue? Well, you know, Tony and I, we're, we're adult siblings. Um, we've always known what our differing views are on this. I know where he comes from. He knows where I come from. And while we hold our differing views, we respect each other. We love each other as siblings, as you do. And we make sure that our relationship as siblings transcends the politics. Uh, but, you know, he and I have spoken since this result was announced. And we're on the same page that we both want Parliament to pass the legislation to reform the Marriage Act to enable same-sex couples to get married in Australia as quickly as possible. Christine, you said that um, you spoke to your brother. Um, w w what did he say? Uh, he said congratulations. And I'll tell you what, coming from probably the best political campaigner of, of his generation in Australia, it feels pretty good to have beaten him in one. <laughs> <laughs> That's Christine Forster there, who's hoping to marry her partner, Virginia, when this law gets through in Australia. Well, back home now, the average Kiwi online shopper is set to pay around $150 per year more in tax, according to consumer spending company Market View, and that's thanks to a law change that was announced by the government this morning. The government forced GST on digital purchases from overseas companies in October last year. Now it will force GST on physical goods bought as well. We already pay GST on purchases over $400, but Market View says the average Kiwi spends around $1,000 a year on multiple transactions, which are less than that. Retailers are happy, saying it will level the playing field for them and it will bring in a lot of extra tax revenue. But as Zach Fleming reports, the government doesn't seem to know key details like how or when. Let's compare prices for Eleanor Catton's Man Booker winning novel, The Luminaries, a Kiwi book by a Kiwi author. At Unity Books in Wellington today, it will cost you $30 for the cheapest version. Go online to Amazon and you'll pick it up for $24.
Or you could snap it up on sale from the book depository in the UK for $13. But if you add GST to the Amazon price, it increases from $24 to $28, which puts it almost on par with Unity. It'll be really cool for our street customers and our onshore online customers to not have to pay that penalising extra 15%. Unity Books co-owner Tilly Lloyd says her customers are paying a surcharge of sorts because they could buy the book minus GST online from overseas. Merely for being a good localist and buying their books locally. Revenue Minister Stuart Nash today announced the government will level the playing field by forcing GST on goods bought online from overseas companies. Think ASOS and Amazon. The details are non-existent though. Mr Nash has refused to be interviewed since and has declined to provide a statement to Checkpoint. There was also confusion at Parliament today after his press secretary announced he would be speaking to media at 1.30. But he didn't show up. He instead left Finance Minister Grant Robertson to explain. Well, what Mr Nash has been saying is that this is an area that we're looking into. It's clearly an area where there's unfairness in the tax system uh, and we want to make sure we address unfairness in the tax system. It's long been Labour Party policy. Uh, now we want to look at how we can um, implement something like that in government. So when the Minister said it was happening this morning, did he mean it is definitely happening? He means that we're working on it and he did say that we don't have you know, the full process or timeline yet for that. His surprise announcement already has local retailers giddy though. Retail NZ spokesperson Greg Harford says it's been a long time coming. This has been the biggest issue uh, facing uh, New Zealand retailers from a tax point of view. Um, it's really good news and it's really just not right that it's letting massive overseas firms like Amazon sell tax free into New Zealand. But what about consumers? You can expect prices from overseas online stores to go up 15%. PwC managing partner and tax expert Jeff Nightingale says that could be offset though because it avoids further rises in income tax. It's estimated around $250 million of tax currently goes uncollected through overseas online purchases. Retail NZ says extrapolated over the next 10 years. The government will be missing out on $5.8 billion in GST revenue. So today's announcement is a big tax revenue announcement, nearly $6 billion across 10 years. But the how and the when are guesswork. All the announcement really says is that they will, will do it. There's, there's no detail on implementation date and the method that they will adopt because there's a range of ways you can do this. Mr Nightingale says it's likely we'd follow what Australia's implementing in July next year. What they've done in Australia is to go to the foreign supplier collection model, which is asking the foreign supplier or the electronic platform, think Amazon, to register for GST in Australia and they would take responsibility for collecting the GST and remitting it to the government and not, not involve customs. So small niche online retailers could weasel their way out of this, essentially? Yes, yep. So in Australia, you only have to register if you're doing more than $75,000 of supplies. For retailers like Unity Books Tilly Lloyd, the sooner the better. It's really good news for our street and online onshore customers. They won't be subsidising... Amazon customers any longer. All it required really was will and courage and now Nash has taken that, that's good. The methodology for applying it, they'll, they'll work it out. But as yet, Mr Nash nor his office can provide even a draft timeline. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. And as Zach pointed out in that story there, the Revenue Minister Stuart Nash made himself unavailable today. Remember though, Labour did promise not to change GST in its first term. The opposition revenue spokesperson for the National Party is Judith Collins. Uh, we'll speak to her uh, uh, after six o'clock tonight on Checkpoint. It's 5.23, 23 minutes past five on Checkpoint. And coming up, soldiers seize control of Zimbabwe's state broadcaster. Auckland's teacher shortage gets so dire that some schools are getting no applicants at all for their vacancies. And we'd love your feedback this evening, especially on Australia's move to legalise same-sex marriage. You can text us on 2101. You can tweet us on at Checkpoint RNZ. Facebook us, Checkpoint with John Campbell, or email us, checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. Also like your feedback on that GST issue. 
Well, the opposition in New Zealand is sceptical of claims by the Prime Minister that progress has been made on Australia being willing to accept the offer to resettle 150 refugees from offshore detention centres. Jacinda Ardern has wrapped up the East Asia Summit with a 20-minute conversation with her Australian counterpart, Malcolm Turnbull, where they discussed further proposals to resolve the ongoing situation on Manus Island. But the National Party says in the end it's still Australia's call. Here's our political editor, Jane Patterson. It's been a whirlwind of speeches and meetings with world leaders for Jacinda Ardern at APEC and the summit in Manila, but Manus Island has remained a high priority. On the last day, she talked to Mr Turnbull about money to support detainees on Manus Island and starting work on a screening programme for refugees. She says officials from the two countries are working closely together. We accept it will take some time to process those on Manus Island and on Nauru a number of months, so working together now and early is important so that we are prepared if and when Australia takes up that offer. Ms Ardern reiterated the only way refugees can be resettled in New Zealand is via Australia. They hold the information, they are the ones who are presiding over the process. There is no other way for us to further this offer than via Australia, which is why we will continue to work alongside them. She says New Zealand will also give Papua New Guinea and aid agencies up to $3 million to help care for the Manus Island refugees. At the moment that's in total what we have put aside for the specific task of supporting PNG in particular as they continue to provide for the needs of those who are on the island and potentially other agencies like the International Red Cross who are continuing to make visits to the island um, uh, to check on the welfare and well-being of those who are there. The National Party leader Bill English says that's in line with New Zealand's general approach in the region. Well, we always contribute to um, you know humanitarian efforts around the place, uh, and this I'm sure it'll be of some assistance. And what I understand is a very large Australian budget there of you know, close to a billion dollars. Ms Ardern says more progress has been made on the offer than in a number of years, but Mr English says in the end it's still up to Australia. It's always been the case that they're not in a position to take up the offer. And it's just a bit, it's, uh, he, I mean the issue here is to what extent is the um, New Zealand's, is our Prime Minister making a showpiece out of this, uh, knowing full well that the Australians are very unlikely to take up the offer. Speaking in Manila, the Foreign Minister Winston Peters told reporters the US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson requested a second meeting in less than a week. But I can't tell you about the details of it. But it was about a specific issue. Yes, it? it was, yes. Was it a security issue? Um, well, I had to describe its dimensions. It's to do with this region mm. and an initiative coming in the future, but I, I would be remiss of me to do, uh, and the Prime Minister mm. has been fully informed of it. Mm. Uh, to divulge what it was about until we know. Tensions over North Korea dominated meetings this week, but RNZ has been told that is not the focus of the initiative. National's Foreign Affairs spokesperson Jerry Brownlee wants more detail on the initiative before commenting on it, but he says New Zealand's position on North Korea is that it should return to democracy. Uh, Myanmar is something we've always also taken a view on, uh, that uh, return to democracy was, was what we wanted. Uh, it's sort of there. Uh, but the, uh, the issues with the um, uh, uh, Ranga people is, is pretty, pretty horrifying, I've got to say. Jacinda Ardern and Winston Peters are travelling back from Manila at the moment and will arrive back in New Zealand tomorrow. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Jane Patterson. 28 minutes past five on Checkpoint. The Mayor of Whangarei, Cheryl Mai, is imploring young people in her city to reach out for help if they're feeling suicidal. There have been at least three suspected suicides in Whangarei in just the past week. Two of them were high school students. Here's Lois Williams. A visibly upset Cheryl Mai has posted her plea by video on her mayoral Facebook page. She'd just heard about the latest death involving a 15-year-old girl. And she says it's incredibly sad that young people in the north should see no hope for their futures. There is support in our community if you need it, please. If you're considering suicide, Talk to someone, make the most of your friendships. Please don't become another one who's lost hope. If there's anything that, that we can do to help, please, please let us know. 
Northland Health says it's been notified of three suspected suicides in the past week. One was the 15-year-old girl, one was a boy aged just 13 and one was a 22-year-old kitty kitty man. But community workers dealing with bereaved whanau say at least two more deaths were suspected suicides. Kahui Neho is an experienced mental health nurse who founded the Green Ribbon Suicide Prevention Group in Whangarei in 2013. She says the pressures turn to pile on at this time of the year for everyone. We've got the pressure now with our, you know, our school kids with um, exams, with the pressure to do well in school, and we've got uh, anniversaries like Christmas, for instance. And there may be times that you know they will be suffering their first Christmas without their grandfather, for instance, with their first Christmas without their grandmother, without their loved ones. That's a huge contributing factor, and we need to start being proactive, not just this time of year. Ms Neho is offering free suicide prevention workshops for whānau groups, marae and schools in Whangarei. They include advice on what parents and families need to watch out for when someone may be thinking about taking their own life and how to help them recover. Northland's suicide rate doubled last year. 36 people took their own lives, many of them Māori. Six of them were young Kaitaia people whose deaths over just a couple of months last winter rocked the town. They were aged between 17 and 25. Social worker Margie Matthews is the manager of Family Works in Whangare. She believes the key to reducing teen suicide is building resilience in a child well before the teenage years. And if families can't do it, she says the community needs to step in with help at school or even preschool. The younger that we start that, the better. It could be programs, it could be having opportunities for kids who are feeling lacking in self-worth, who are perhaps not achieving, who have issues at home, has somebody to talk to and act upon what they're saying so they don't believe a lot of the stuff is their fault. Margie Matthews says Family Works has just begun a social worker and preschool service to identify and help at-risk children and their families. The Northland DHB says there have been six suspected youth suicides in Northland in 2017, but it remains committed to getting that number down to zero. It says anyone thinking about suicide or worried about a friend or loved one who may be can ring or text 1737, free of charge, any time, day or night, for help and advice. For Checkpoint, Lois Williams. You're with Checkpoint and coming up in Auckland, Iwi calls for a ban on access to the Waitakere Ranges by Christmas to protect the area from the Cody dieback disease and a narrow victory for a fresh-faced all-black team against the French in a rare midweek encounter in Lyon. But first, here's Katrina Batten with the headlines. The police are warning Wellington commuters of a massive increase in traffic tomorrow because of the train strike. Rail workers are stopping work for 24 hours in their first big strike in decades. The region's entire rail network will be shut down from 2 o'clock tomorrow morning. As well as workers, high school students facing exams in eight subjects for NCEA and scholarship will be affected by the strike. In an historic poll, Australians have overwhelmingly voted in favour of legalising same-sex marriage. The non-binding postal vote showed nearly 62% of people favour allowing same-sex marriage to wed. The Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull says his government will seek to pass legislation to legalise same-sex marriage by the end of the year. The police have made the South Island's biggest seizure of methamphetamine, 49 kilos of the drug with an estimated street value of $15 million. The drugs arrived in Christchurch in an air freight consignment of safety lights sent from Mexico on November the 1st. Two men have appeared in court. The National Party is questioning whether the Prime Minister has made any progress on convincing Australia to accept New Zealand's offer to take 150 refugees from offshore detention centres. Jacinda Ardern's wrapped up the East Asia summit with the conversation with her Australian counterpart about the situation on Manus Island. Auckland school principals are worried the city's teacher shortage will force them to cancel subjects and squeeze more children into classrooms. The Manurewa Principals Association and Auckland Secondary Principals Association say some of their members are receiving no applications at all for their vacancies.
The Ministry for Primary Industries says it will work with the Auckland Council on making a decision to close the Waitakere Ranges to prevent the spread of Cody dieback disease. It follows an Auckland Iwi's call for the government to use the Biosecurity Act to enable Arahui stopping people entering the ranges. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Thanks very much, Katrina. Now turning to business news. Nona Peltier is with us. House prices have been rising throughout the country, but not in Auckland. What's going on? Oh, it's all those apartment <laughs> shoppers, people buying apartments. They're cheaper than houses, and as a result of that, the prices have fallen in Auckland. So house prices are still high in Auckland, folks, uh, but apartments uh, have been bringing down the average, and that's really what's been happening. And I suppose that's going to continue because if you look around Auckland, you'll see there's that's a lot going up, of, isn't it? there sure are a lot of apartments being built. So you can expect to see that continue for a while, perhaps. It doesn't necessarily mean that houses are any, little, any less cheaper, and also first-time home buyers are having a very hard time getting into the market just the same. Banks don't like uh, lending so much on mortgages for apartments because naturally there's a lot of them. There's price pressure on that. They're more volatile. They yes, are. They're more absolutely. susceptible to that. And so, um, in any case, the uh, Real Estate Institute is asking that when the Reserve Bank reviews housing policy, that it considers easing the restrictions for first-time buyers because they really are struggling to, to get that deposit to get in, together. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. OK, um, transport, a main freight. They've turned a, a pretty decent profit by the looks of things. Yeah. But they're still disappointed. Why is that? <laughs> well, apparently it's not quite good not enough. enough. <laughs> no, it's not enough. Uh, they thought that they would do much better, as a matter of fact, and they were really not very happy with the management in uh, two of their divisions while in Asia and the United States, so they uh, replaced the management there. Mm -hmm. you know, so there you go. No, they weren't very happy. They expected to do better. They thought they should have done better, but they had uh, issues, of course, with the earthquakes and all that kind of stuff. And in the end, uh, the revenue wasn't what they hoped it would be. It was up, though, 7% to $1.2 billion. Some people are never happy, you know. No, and their profit, well, it was a little bit flat with the year earlier, but still an improvement, $42.2 million. You'd think you'd be happy with that, but actually, that's not even a full year. That's only a six-month uh, profit. So overall, I mean, I don't know market wasn't that happy about it well, anyway. How are the markets looking today? Well, okay, for Main Freight's price on their first half result there, uh, let's see, their price was down 1.5%. Mm. 37 cents to 23.75, but look, the top 50 index, it fell just eight points to 8,000, and that's really in line with what we're seeing in Asia and also what we saw coming out of Wall Street, and that's because of oil prices. Uh, the International Energy Agency has decided that there's probably going to be a downturn and uh, less demand for energy, and as a result of that, oil prices fell. That put a bit of a chill in the market. We saw that coming through in New Zealand, Australia, Asia. And so our dollar is mixed. It's a little bit weaker against the U.S. at 68.7 U.S. cents and stronger against the Australian at 90.6, 52.3 pence. There we are. All the numbers. Thanks, Nona. Appreciate your time. It's uh, coming up to 20 to 6 on Checkpoint. Let's move to rail now and uh, go to the capital where Wellington is bracing for its biggest rail strike in more than two decades. Members of the Rail and Maritime Transport Union will strike for 24 hours from 2 o'clock tomorrow morning, halting all trains in the capital and that's expected to cause widespread disruption as you can imagine tens of thousands of commuters including students who are sitting exams. Here's Eric Frickberg. There'll be no easy answers for high school students facing NCEA and scholarship exams in the capital tomorrow but one thing's certain they'll have to get up early to beat what's likely to be gridlock traffic. The acting principal of Wellington Girls College Joe Carl says about 30 girls from her school will face this challenge. We've talked on social media we've put it on our website we've emailed the girls themselves just telling them that it's to be aware of it and to make plans to arrive earlier than they would do normally. Karen Spencer is a deputy principal at Wellington High School. She sought help for her students from the Qualifications Authority. We've been informed that students who cannot get to their exam centre will not get a derived grade and that emergency grades do not apply in this situation. But we have also been told that schools around the region, if they have room, can accept local students who might not be able to get into the city centre. Students are just some of those making the 30,000 train trips in the capital each day. I'll be driving in. Where from? Wainuiomata. So which train do you normally get? 6.23. 
What time will you be leaving tomorrow? Probably quarter to six. Uh, I'll be working from home. Right, have you been quite good about it? Uh, yeah, really good. Um, I'm not, I'm going to work from home. Are you? Right, and you? Um, coming in with a friend. So, uh, you're, you're carpooling tomorrow? Yep. Okay, what time does that mean you leave? We're leaving earlier, but getting in later. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be working from home tomorrow. John Milford is Chief Executive of Wellington Chamber of Commerce. He says managers will encourage their staff to work from home or carpool if possible. Even so, many companies will experience lower productivity and lower profitability. Say 10% of the people who could be in the city don't come in the city. There's then an impact on CAFs, hospitality, hairdressers. All of these people will be impacted in some way, shape or form. One person who will definitely suffer is a 21-year-old beautician, Tash Buckley. I don't have a car, so I live out in Parramatta, so it's not really an option for me to come in tomorrow, unfortunately. So, yeah, it's just sort of going to be like a, a day off, I suppose. So I'm going to have to reschedule some of my clients that I had booked in, so that's going to be quite disruptive, unfortunately. Strikes like this usually go down to the wire, with a reprieve possible to the last minute. But comments from a senior company executive, David Gould, suggests it's unlikely this time. We would be back at the table in a heartbeat if the union would meet us and engage in proper good faith negotiation. And I understand that the union's position is unchanged. They say, withdraw all your claims or we will not talk to you. Wayne Butson from the union says he was contacted by mediators this afternoon. I said that unless there was a change in attitude on the part of the employer, then I didn't see a lot of point. Sadly, it does look as there's no way of avoiding this action because clearly the employer is saying one thing and doing another. Wellingtonians who endure this will have to put up with something else as well. No replacement bus services because a 50-seater bus can't come close to replacing an 800-seater train. For Checkpoint, Eric Frickberg. To one of our major international stories now, a speculation of a coup in Zimbabwe tonight as soldiers and military vehicles have been deployed right across the capital, Harare, and troops have seized the offices of the state broadcaster there. Explosions, gunfire have been reported overnight from the northern suburbs of the city in the area around the home of its president, Robert Mugabe. A short time ago, a military officer appeared on television saying the army is moving to pacify a destabilising situation and will target the criminals surrounding President Mugabe. That's what the announcement has said. Here's Sarah Corker from the BBC. Soldiers and armed vehicles on the outskirts of the Zimbabwean capital. Small numbers, but enough to raise concern. Especially after the head of the armed forces threatened to take action over the sacking of an influential politician. We must remind those behind the current treacherous shenanigans that when it comes to matters of protecting our revolution, the military will not hesitate to step in. The general was referring to the sacking of Vice President Emerson Umnumgagwa, a long-time ally of Robert Mugabe. He was once seen as a favourite to succeed his lifelong political patron. His dismissal last week was viewed as a move by Mr Mugabe to hand power to his wife, Grace. And in Harare, this was how people reacted to the news of military movements. What is needed right now in Zimbabwe is to, 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 to remove this Mugabe family in power. If there is this implosion, the implosion is good for the citizenry of Zimbabwe. Robert Mugabe is the world's oldest head of state. He's been in power since 1980, but this dispute over succession is now escalating. Soldiers have taken over the headquarters of Zimbabwe's state broadcaster and in a live address, officers said the president was safe and that the country was not undergoing a coup. But the US and UK embassies have urged their citizens in Zimbabwe to remain home on Wednesday due to the ongoing political uncertainty. Sarah Corker there reporting for the BBC. And Auckland Iwi is calling on the government to place a rahui or ban across the Waitakere Ranges to protect it from the Kauri dieback disease. Te Kawaro Amaki wants to stop people entering the ranges. Locals and visitors who enjoy them back the ban and say a rahui may be the only way to protect the giants of the New Zealand forest. Te Manu Korihi reporter John Boynton has more. 
Te Kawiroa Maki Executive Manager Edward Ashby says the iwi wants to stop people entering the ranges. He believes it will be more effective than Auckland Council's current measures, which include increased signage and shoe cleaning stations on tracks. We were getting tired of, of sort of endless meetings and endless reports while, the, in our view, the forest continued to die. In Titirangi, a smattering of people enjoy a brisk brunch amongst a leafy backdrop on the fringes of the 16,000 hectare Waitakere Ranges. Brian Moore has lived in Titsirangi for the last 25 years and knows the walking tracks around the range as well, often working on predator control programs in the area. He says if current council control measures such as cleaning stations aren't effective, Arahui will help to safeguard the ranges for future generations. I'm not against it, but I'd like to see money go into continual research of the problem, but I'm certainly not averse to having the trails closed off for an indefinite period while we do more scientific investigation. The easy public access to the ranges is both a blessing and a curse. I think we're extraordinarily lucky to have this public reserve on our doorstep. It's so accessible and that's part of its problem. It is very accessible, but it's incredibly important to protect the ranges. One of the key areas of research Brian Moore wants to see is more emphasis on the transmission of Cody dieback in the ranges. The role of pigs in the transmission, if we could put more, more money into pig control programs, at least that might be eliminating one method of control. Gary Johnson from Te Aratu is a frequent visitor to Titirangi and I asked him what kept him returning to the Waitakere ranges. Oh, it's all a native bush, definitely. It's good to get away from just the concrete, so it's good getting out here, you can relax. He supported the idea of Arahui being put in place, saying the short-term inconvenience of its closure would benefit the rangers in the long run. It would be a shame in a travesty for something like that to take hold and kill those beautiful trees. I think the track should be closed off if it's going to preserve, basically it's a heritage for New Zealand really. At the Arataki Visitors Centre, I met Teo Paino from Singapore, who was wrapping up her holiday in New Zealand. She says Arahui should be put in place if it's the one way to keep Cody dieback at bay. You all should, I mean, close the park to protect your environment, to prevent the spread of the disease. Auckland Council Community Services Director Ian Maxwell says the council is upping its prevention measures like increasing signage and improving shoe clearing stations on the tracks. The council hasn't yet decided to back the Rahui despite the Kawiroa Maki's stance and would be working with Iwi to see how council could support a Rahui. Mo te hotaka o te ahiahinei, ko John Boynton Aho. The teacher shortage in Auckland has got so bad that some schools are getting no applicants at all for the vacancies that they put up. Principals describe the situation as dire and say they have to resist hiring teachers who are simply not up to the mark. They also fear they will have to cancel subjects and increase the number of children in some classes next year. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen filed this report. The teacher shortage is the worst Karen McMurray from Randwick Park School in Manurewa has seen in 20 years. We currently have two vacancies at our school and to date I've had no applicants not even no unsuitable ones, absolutely none. And I know that I'm just one of many in our area. Do you think that you might get some applicants, say if they're open for three, four weeks, or is it actually the case that people are getting no applicants at all? People are getting no applicants at all. Karen McMurray says she doesn't know how she'll staff the school if she can't fill her vacancies. It is a real concern and it's compromising the education of our children which can have a long-term effect on society if we can't get quality people educating children to become adult citizens who, are, who can contribute to the workforce. Frances Nelson from Fairburn School says she has three vacancies for experienced teachers and so far they've attracted only one suitable applicant. The rest are from overseas or newly graduated. She says principals are losing sleep over the teacher shortage. It's absolutely dire and it's keeping principals awake and I'm sure other people in school settings as well awake at night because we know that we will not be able to get suitable applicants into our schools for the beginning of next year. Frances Nelson says principals are resisting hiring unsuitable teachers simply to fill vacancies and Auckland families need to be ready for more big classes. 
as the population grows, and it certainly is in Auckland, people just have to accept that class numbers will have to go up and that there will be a lot of inexperienced teachers in the system and bear with schools and bear with the system and support it. James Thomas from the Auckland Secondary Principals Association says some Auckland schools have had no applicants at all for vacancies and not just in hard-to-fill subjects like maths and science. He says some are worried they'll be forced to cancel classes next year because they can't find enough teachers. I met the other day with a cross-section of principals from around Auckland, about 12 of us, and not one is fully staffed for next year. And a couple of them are looking to get letters out to their parent community before Christmas Actually warning, saying, hey, your child might want to do this subject, but because of a staffing crisis, we might not be able to offer it. James Thomas says that looks set to happen in mainstream subjects. The ones I've heard about are the uh, real challenges in technology and also some of the other specialist areas. So it's not, it's not about a class because there's three kids in the class, we're not going to offer it because it's not viable. It's that actually there are 25 kids who might want to do it at year 11 or 12, but we just don't have the staff to cover it. The Education Minister's office says the government is planning to announce a teacher supply initiative before Christmas, and the Education Ministry is working on the problem as fast as it can. For Checkpoint... John Gerritsen. A lot of you have been getting in touch over this issue of charging GST on international online purchases as announced by Stuart Nash this morning. Anne has got in touch worried about books. She says a lot of us will no longer be able to afford to buy books. Who can afford $30? Books are affordable in the UK, Anne says, but not here. There should be no GST on books. Uh, Also, this in from Peter who says, I shop at Amazon because stuff is just there, off the shelf, no waiting uh, while it is bought in. The New Zealand market, Peter says, is too small for our wide tastes. Thanks for that feedback. Keep it coming in. I know there's a lot of interest in this issue. To Washington now, where the US Attorney General Jeff Sessions has been facing a barrage of curly questions at a House Judiciary Committee hearing. He's defended himself and his Justice Department, saying the White House has not influenced any investigations into the Russia meddling in the 2016 presidential election and insisting that he's told the truth in the Russia probes, despite some apparent problems with his memory. CNN's Manu Raju reports. Attorney General Jeff Sessions testifying that he now remembers a March 2016 meeting with George Papadopoulos a campaign advisor who wanted to set up a meeting between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. I do now recall that the March 2016 meeting at the Trump Hotel that Mr. Papadopoulos attended, but I have no clear recollection of the details of what he said at that meeting. I'm not aware. Sessions in previous testimony said he was not aware of any communications between campaign surrogates and the Russians. Papadopoulos pleaded guilty to making false statements to the FBI about his Russian contacts. Sessions went on to say he rejected Papadopoulos' request to set up a meeting between Trump and Putin. I wanted to make clear to him that he was not authorized to represent the campaign with the Russian government or any other foreign government for that matter. In one of many heated exchanges with House Democrats, Sessions insisted that his answers have not changed. And he did not lie. You did have communications with the Russians last year, isn't that right? Just yes or no? I had a meeting with the Russian ambassador, yes. Great. That is exactly the opposite answer you gave under oath to U.S. Senate. So again, either you're lying to U.S. Senate or you're lying to U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, I hope the congressman knows, and I hope all of you know, uh, that my answer to that question, I did not meet with the Russians, was explicitly responding uh, to the shocking suggestion that I, as a surrogate, was meeting on a continuing basis with Russian officials, and the implication was to impact the campaign in some sort of nefarious way. And all I did was meet in my office with the ambassador, which we didn't discuss anything like that. So I just uh, uh, want to say I appreciate uh, the congressman's right. I guess he can say it's free speech. He can't be sued here. And so uh, that's just uh, my response. And I'm sorry that um, that's my response. Not but when pressed for more details, the attorney general frequently I said he couldn't recall. 
something he repeated more than 20 times. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. That's Attorney General Jeff Sessions uh, having some problems with his memory there in that report from Manu Raju in Washington. Well, back home, well, it was a scrappy, intense game, wasn't it? But a second string all blacks line up eventually prevailed over the French a French selection. It was 28 23 in the end in Lyon, and the All Blacks remain unbeaten on the side's Northern Hemisphere tour. The All Blacks fielded a pretty inexperienced lineup, which was captained by their one test All Black, Luke Whitelock. Here's our sports editor, Stephen Hewson. That is time, New Zealand. That is time. They've been told it's time, so they get it back and they can kick it out, which they do. Into touch it goes, and the All Blacks have the victory. The All Blacks coach Steve Hansen declared it mission accomplished in the wake of the narrow but scrappy win after the tourists had trailed 15-14 at half time. There's six of them having their first game and there wouldn't be probably another six that haven't played more than four games. So uh, they played some really good rugby, um, you know, particularly early on in the game and then uh, there was periods where France got momentum and uh, they defended their hearts out. So. All in all, uh, you know, mission accomplished. Hansen also lamented the state of French rugby in his post-match interview with Sky TV. The French national side has slumped to eighth on the world rankings and Hansen says it underlines the lack of development of local players with the privately owned French clubs hiring too many foreigners. French rugby is not dead and gone, but you know, I do think there's too many foreigners playing over here and, and uh, if they want... To be strong again, they're going to have to uh, make room for these young guys to be able to play every week and um, you know, gain the experience you need them to get to develop. After the match, Hansen also took a swipe at replays on the big screen at the Lyon Stadium. Two major decisions went against the All Blacks during the closing stages of the match, both seemingly influenced by replays on the big screen that were then picked up by the crowd and subsequently led to the television match official becoming involved. Hanson says he'll be following up with World Rugby how big screen replays are used selectively to favour the home side. The match also marked was likely to be halfback Tawira Kerbalo's final game for the All Blacks. Kerbalo, who's played 25 tests, is signed with French club La Rochelle on a three-year deal. Sitting behind Aaron Smith and TJ Perinara in the halfback pecking order, Kerbalo knows he's unlikely to get any game time in the final two tests of the tour against Scotland and Wales. You know, I told myself I've, I've got a job to do and there's no use being an emotional wreck out there. You know, I've got to go and, and do my mahi so, uh, so, we can, so we can get the result we wanted. But obviously uh, we'll see what happens later on in the tour, but um, proud moment especially for my, my family. The All Blacks' penultimate match of the tour is against Scotland at Murrayfield on Sunday morning. In 30 tests, the All Blacks have never lost to the Scots. The closest Scotland's ever come to victory are two draws, the last of which was in 1983. For Checkpoint, Stephen Hewson. A survey by the UK, UK firm Viking shows two-thirds of workers eat their lunch at their desks or skip it entirely. Our reporter Emile Donovan investigates what's happening. It's a site most office workers can probably relate to at what's supposed to be lunchtime. Coffee in one hand, egg and mayo sandwich in the other, Huddled over the keyboard trying to update spreadsheets with your forehead while spraying crumbs over the monitor like a combine harvester. But Peter Boxall, who lectures in human resource management at the University of Auckland, says that really isn't healthy. There's always been a tendency for some people to overcommit. They're more highly committed than they need to be. And the very extreme of that, of course, is workaholism, where people really do, in an unhealthy way, overcommit to work. A September survey of 1,500 UK workers shows more than two-thirds of people either eat their lunch at their desks or forego a lunch break altogether. And a trip down Wellington's Lambton Quay today suggests that's a tendency New Zealanders share. Do you guys ever find yourselves working through lunch breaks? Yeah, pretty much every day. Yes, I do. Why? Sometimes it's because I'm really busy, other times it's because I feel a bit bad that nobody else is taking a lunch break. <laughs> One of the most commonly cited reasons for working through lunch is there's just too much work to get on top of, or stepping out is frowned on by colleagues. Probably not in my current job, but in my last job definitely. It became like a precedent that no one really took lunch breaks, so it was sort of expected that you work through. But Peter Boxall says regular breaks are actually good for productivity. 
if people are living a more balanced kind of life, there's a good balance between work and recovery, then they're more likely to be tolerant of their colleagues and make a good contribution in teamwork. They're more likely to be patient with others. They're more likely to, you know, introduce their own creativity. Uh, so it's a range of benefits here. So what are a worker's rights when it comes to lunch and rest breaks? The Employment Relations Act doesn't spell out lengths of time, but workers are entitled to breaks that provide reasonable opportunity for rest and refreshment. And the PSA National Secretary, Glenn Barclay, says the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment has guidelines on its website around how long meal and rest breaks should be. At least a half hour. Um, and having 10, 15 minutes morning, afternoon tea each, I think it's, is, is critical. You want to have them as genuine breaks in the middle. That's the best way to preserve people's peace of mind, give them the chance to recover and to enhance productivity as well. That is Emile Donovan reporting there. I have to say that I ate my lunch at uh, my desk uh, this afternoon. Apparently that's not the thing to do. Here's Katrina Batten with the headlines. RNZ News at 6. Ngamihi Nui, good evening. Call Katrina Batanaho. The Wellington train operator Transdev has ruled out any chance of tomorrow's 24 hour rail strike being averted. The region's entire train network will be shut down from 2 o'clock tomorrow morning. This afternoon, the company's managing director, Alan Bannister, was at the Wellington railway station handing out pamphlets to commuters explaining what will happen. Mr Bannister says he's very sorry the strike is going ahead and it comes after months of negotiations with the union under the shadow of the threat of industrial action. He told RNZ News he isn't hopeful last-minute negotiations will settle the dispute. We're using the negotiation and hopefully with mediators. Um, we've offered the RMTU the, the potential to come and talk at any time. We were told by the RMTU at the last meetings that the negotiation phase was over um, and they haven't come back to the table since. We would welcome a phone call at any time, but um, I'm afraid that tomorrow it's very unlikely that we'll be able to run any services. When was your last meeting? It would have been um, a week last Friday. Alan Bannister of Transdev. Meanwhile, the police are warning commuters there'll be a massive increase in traffic tomorrow because of the strike. Wellington's road policing manager, Jan Craig, says roads will be congested and drivers will need to be sensible. She's asking people to be patient and considerate and to think about getting on the road earlier or later than usual. In Australia, legislation to legalise same-sex marriage is likely to be introduced this afternoon after an overwhelming yes vote. Nearly 62% of people who took part in a non-binding postal uh, poll voted to allow same-sex couples to wed. High-profile same-sex marriage advocate Christine Forster, who's also the sister of the ex-Prime Minister Tony Abbott, says the country has voted for basic human equality. It's been pretty emotional, I must say. Yeah. It's been a long, hard fight. It's been a long road. A lot of people have contributed to this. But most of all, two-thirds of Australians have voted for it. They've voted for equality. Christine Forster. Zimbabwe's military says its operations on the streets of the capital are not a takeover of the government and are designed to target criminals. Troops were deployed across Harare and seized the state broadcaster today after Robert Mugabe's ruling ZANU-PF party accused the head of the military of treason, prompting speculation of a coup. Explosions have reportedly rocked the city centre. An unnamed officer in fatigues has spoken on national television in the past hour. To both our people and the world beyond our borders, we wish to make it abundantly clear that this is not a military takeover of government. What the Zimbabwe Defence Forces is doing is to pacify a degenerating political, social and economic situation in our country. The officer went on to urge traditional tribal leaders to provide leadership to their people. The National Party is questioning whether the Prime Minister has made any progress on convincing Australia to accept New Zealand's offer to take 150 refugees from its offshore detention centres. Jacinda Ardern's wrapped up the East Asia Summit with a conversation with her Australian counterpart, Malcolm Turnbull, about the situation on Manus Island. New Zealand will give Papua New Guinea and aid agencies up to $3 million to help care for the refugees holed up in the decommissioned camp on the island where all the facilities have been shut down. Officials will also start laying the groundwork for a screening process that can be quickly put in place if and when Australia accepts the offer. 
Ms Ardern says this marks more progress than has been made for many years. Nationals leader Bill English says in the end it's still up to Australia. The issue here is to what extent is the um, New Zealand is our Prime Minister making a showpiece out of this, uh, knowing full well that the Australians are very unlikely to take up the offer. Bill English. The Finance Minister has dismissed suggestions the new government will have to borrow much more than originally planned. The country's biggest bank, ANZ, is warning the Labour-led government may have to borrow another $3 billion to meet its spending promises, Anusha Bradley reports. During the election, Labour said it would borrow about $11 billion more than National to pay for big-ticket policies such as Kiwi Build and restarting contributions to the Super Fund. At the same time, it promised to reduce the country's debt levels to 20% of GDP over the next five years. But ANZ's chief economist Cameron Bagri believes the government will have to borrow much more and it won't be able to reduce debt at all. The Finance Minister Grant Robertson disagrees. He says he's received advice that it's possible to meet the spending pledges and reduce debt. Mr Robertson says more details will be revealed in the half-yearly fiscal and economic update due out before Christmas. This is Anusha Bradley. The Ministry for Primary Industries says it believes it still has an outbreak of a cow disease in South Canterbury contained, despite another farm becoming infected. An eighth farm has tested positive for Mycoplasma bovis, a neighbour of a Van Leeuwen dairy group farm at the heart of the outbreak. The Ministry's incident controller, David Yard, says the Ministry is not sure whether the infection was transmitted by stock transfers or over-the-fence animal contact. Mr Yard says he's disappointed but not surprised Surprised by the new infection. The find of the infected property is in a very closely defined region within the Waimati district where we have all the other positive farms. We do potentially expect to find more but hope not too many because we believe we have the disease contained at the very least. David Yard says a complete cull of infected farms is going ahead with the aim of completely eradicating the disease from the region. It's six minutes past six. To sport and the New Zealand coach Anthony Hudson is confident striker Chris Wood will be fit to start tomorrow's second leg football World Cup playoff against Peru in Lima. He's more circumspect though about the chances of defender Tommy Smith. Wood played a limited role in Saturday's nil-all nil first leg draw in Wellington due to a hamstring injury. Hudson's relying on Wood to add leadership and English Premier League level experience in a challenging environment in front of 50,000 parochial Peruvian fans. Hudson rates Smith only a 50-50 chance of playing due to a calf injury and he'll do a fitness test before the match. The Black Cap selector Gavin Larson says wicketkeeper BJ Watling must get through the next two rounds of domestic Plunkett Shield cricket with Northern Districts if he's to play in the upcoming Test Series against the West Indies. Watling has been bothered by a hip injury and Larson says he must prove his fitness playing in the domestic game. It's precautionary that he plays this next game for ND as a batsman only and then um, he'll keep working on his, on his keeping drills and then we'll need to see BJ in action with the gloves in the Plunkett Shield Round 5 match at Alexandra. Gavin Larson. And the coach of the World Championship winning New Zealand men's softball team, Mark Sorensen, has been reappointed to the role for more than two years. Uh, for two more years, sorry, through to the end of the 2019 World Champs in Prague. That's the news. Powerful forces. If no one's willing to stand up to powerful forces threatening one way or another to punish you if you don't say what you feel to be the truth, then what well, we've lost. Tricks in Manila. She's pulled a rabbit out of the hat on this one. And spells in Peru. The witch doctor putting a curse on the New Zealand team outside, walking around, chanting it, waving this live snake around, and there's some sort of potion brewing and, and lots of smoke and steam coming up. Magic on your radio. Kim Hill and John Campbell hosting Morning Report this week from 6. Then on 9 to noon, upholding the electoral process in Somaliland's presidential elections, we talk to the New Zealander who's the chief international observer there. And after 10, two times winner of the Booker Prize, prolific Australian writer Peter Carey on his new book which tackles Australia's indigenous past. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after morning report on RNZ National.
Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Whanganui, including Coromandel Bay of Plenty and the central high country. A few showers, especially inland and about the ranges, where some could be heavy and thundery with hail during the afternoon and evenings. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mainly fine, but afternoon and evening showers about the ranges, some possibly heavy and thundery tomorrow. Manawatu to Wellington and Wairarapa, mainly fine. Nelson Buller and Westland, fine and cloudy periods with isolated afternoon and evening showers about the ranges. Marlborough, Canterbury, Otago and Southland, mainly fine. However, areas of cloud morning and evening and isolated showers about the Canterbury foothills and Kaikoura ranges tomorrow afternoon. Fiordland, fine today. Shh, cloudy periods uh, tomorrow with showers in the south and for the Chatham Islands a few light showers clearing tomorrow afternoon it's nine and a half past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks very much Katrina there have been great scenes of celebration in the streets in Australia as Australians said I do today to same-sex marriage just under 80 percent of eligible voters turned out for this it was a non-binding postal survey, they called it, 61% voted to legalise same-sex marriage. Australia's Prime Minister has now pledged to pass a law by Christmas to make same-sex marriage legal. The Green Senator, Sarah Hanson-Young, has campaigned for marriage equality for many years now, introducing a private member's bill nearly a decade back. Uh, Senator Hanson Young also kickstarted the Yes campaign for this historic vote. I spoke to her a little earlier this afternoon and she described to me how she felt when the result was announced. Feeling pretty bloody good. I'm very, very proud of Australia right now. I just think our campaign, none of these issues are ever um, easily won and yet Australians have turned out in droves to campaign, to make phone calls, to talk to friends and family and most importantly to post their votes back to the ABS and with such a resounding yes vote. The Parliament has no other option now but to just get on and get this done. So how will it actually proceed from here because as I understand it there were uh, a number of more conservative uh, politicians in Australia who, who wanted to do things like protect religious freedoms as they saw it, they may be um, somehow damaged in their view uh, by this. Where does that debate yeah. go now? How does that sort well, of play out? So uh, the bill that will go to the Senate tomorrow and that we will start debate on um, is a bill that um, changes the law so that it doesn't matter what your sexuality is, if you're two consenting, loving adults, you can get married, as, as it should and as, as the Australian people have asked for. Um, in that bill, uh, there is clarification around religious protection. So it says that if, if you're a religious uh, organisation and you're a religious minister and you don't support uh, this, then you don't have to marry uh, a couple who, who, who are in a gay relationship. Um, but it doesn't allow for further discrimination. It doesn't say that... Uh, you know, uh, bakers or florists or taxi drivers can discriminate against uh, couples that are getting married or indeed uh, guests who are attending the wedding, which, of course, um, even some of these conservatives uh, who would like to wind back, uh, you know, this overwhelming support for equality uh, would have uh, done. I think, overwhelmingly, there are still people, yes, of course, some conservatives in this parliament who are going to try and cause trouble uh, but with such a resounding result, with such overwhelming support uh, for equality, um, they will be they, they will be drowned out. And the turnout has been amazing, just short of eighty percent in a voluntary uh, in a voluntary vote, uh, which is just uh, unheard of here in Australia. Um, and what I'm most proud about, um, Guyon, is the response from young Australians who overwhelmingly voted, uh, uh, turned out to vote and voted yes, um, you know, close to 80%. And I just think that is incredibly um, positive for the future of this country. Mm. I can hear it in your voice, um, how delighted you are, which, which is lovely. But ha have you got already stories or, or scenes that you can share? I'm just trying to get to what it actually means mm -hmm. for, for people. I've been on this journey for a long time. Uh, my first private member's bill when I entered the parliament in 2008 
was for marriage equality. Um, I've had um, <laughs> several other bills since then. In 2008, when that bill went to a vote, only five members in the entire parliament voted for it. And I was told this wasn't an issue that Australians would care about. I was told this, you know, this is a fringe issue. Um, it, it's never going to happen. Um, well, how um, quickly things change over nine years. Uh, we've seen other countries around the world uh, change and Australia has finally is, is finally catching up. I didn't want to say, where the bloody hell are you? Um, <laughs> but, um... Exactly. I mean, it's, it's one thing to, to, um, to be beaten in the rugby. There's another <laughs> thing to be beaten uh, when it comes to marriage equality. And I must say, I've, I've, I've been... Um, embarrassed ever since the amazing uh, result of marriage equality uh, coming uh, to the fore in New Zealand. And, and we have been following you. And, of course, um, we've been following... The, the Parliament has been following the public. The public have dragged uh, the Parliament there. Uh, we now have to respond uh, and respect the will of the people, and that's my message to Conservatives. Uh, you know, don't stuff this around. It would be an act of democratic bastardry and betrayal uh, if people tried to stuff around with this now in, in, with parliamentary tactics. I urge them not to be that silly. Um, Australians are smarter than that. We've got a great bullshit detector. They voted against that and they voted yes for love. And just finally and quickly, uh, Sarah, I wanted to ask you about Manus Island and uh, Prime Minister Turnbull's relationship with uh, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern over these um, negotiations, over what happens to these refugees. There's been some talk in the media here that um, Malcolm Turnbull has snubbed Jacinda Ardern and also uh, that the Australian government was leaking against New Zealand with these reports that four boats had been turned around where the people had been are destined and bound for New Zealand. What do you make of the way Malcolm Turnbull is handling this issue with New Zealand at the moment? Well, look, I think uh, Malcolm Turnbull is handling this appallingly. It's uh, just an international shame on Australia and, and, and stain on our reputation of a fair go to, uh, on one hand, um, keep these people... Uh, uh, kind of abandoned on Manus Island at the behest of the Australian government, uh, refused to bring them to Australia, but then say, oh, well, you know, um, those that New Zealand is ha uh, happy to take, uh, they can't go there. I mean, that is the definition of cruelty, um, keeping people um, in, in suffering, uh, in harsh and inhumane conditions, uh, beating all hope out of them, and then saying when there is a glimmer of hope, a glimmer of support from somebody else, uh, that they can't be given that assistance. Can I say, I, I, I know um, your Prime Minister, uh, Jacinda, I think she's a fantastic uh, leader for decency and uh, she's really showing here in Australia uh, that um, leadership doesn't have to be about being tough and nasty, uh, that it can be shown in a strength of empathy and compassion. That is the Green Senator Sarah Hansen Young. We ended on Manus Island, but largely we're talking to her, weren't we, about the same sex marriage survey? A big yes vote for that today. So, what do people on the streets make of today's news that same sex marriage would be legal in Australia by Christmas? The ABC's Thomas Ariti went to Sydney's inner west suburbs to gauge the reaction. I voted no. How do you feel about the result today then? So it's about 61.6% voted yes. Yeah, OK. I'm oh, a little bit disappointed, to be honest. Um, what do you do in cases like this? Australia's spoken. How do you feel about the postal vote in general? Do you think it should have happened in the first place? No, I think it was a waste of time and a waste of our taxpayers' money. Marriage should be between a man and a woman. I think there's a lot of hoo-ha over nothing that those who like to have same-sex marriage have been able to live together and do all the things they want to do without having any or more of this hoo-ha. You've heard the result now emerging from uh, this yoga class. How do you feel about it? I'm delighted. I'm, I'm surprised that it was marginal, but I'm delighted. I grew up in London in the 70s and I went... Um, I, I grew up in a, in a highly multicultural diverse community, very artistic community, and yet children who came from mixed race marriages were still frowned upon. Children who came from broken homes, as we called them then, were still frowned upon. It was definitely an anomaly. Things have to change. It takes a long time for communities to accept. But I think bigotry 
is born through ignorance. I thought it would be higher, but I'm extremely pleased that it got through. How did you feel about the postal vote? Is it an avenue that you think the government should have taken? No, I think they should have voted themselves. I think we, they represent us. They should have made that call. They should know what the electorate feels. I'm just happy that common sense has prevailed. And I felt that by doing the postal vote, they were out to, to sort of raise anger and, and put one side against the other. I voted no. What were your concerns? Just the things about schooling. At first I was thinking yes, but then I read into it and what I read about the schools, how things might change with the children and putting ideas into children's heads, that, that sort of made me a little bit concerned. And now we've heard the results. What do you think should happen if the majority of Australians have voted yes? Should a bill be put before the parliament to allow same-sex marriage? I don't, think, I don't think it does matter what we voted. I think they'll do their own thing. Uh, some of the people that Thomas Loretti spoke to on the streets of Sydney earlier today. Let's go to some breaking news now. This just coming in. County's Monaco police say they have arrested a man following a homicide investigation into the death of Arish Machan. Now, the 24-year-old mother died in the early hours of Sunday morning, shortly after returning home from a party with her boyfriend. He had left and shortly after that she called her parents because she was frightened that someone was outside. When her parents arrived just 20 minutes later, they found their daughter dead in a bedroom. Now, police say a 41-year-old man from Flatbush has been charged with murder. and He is due to appear tomorrow in the Monaco District Court. Well, you will soon have to pay GST when you shop online, even if you're buying from overseas companies. The Revenue Minister Stuart Nash made the announcement this morning saying the current system is unfair to local retailers because big businesses like your Amazons uh, essentially sell goods to us tax-free. Well, the move could bring in around $6 billion in tax revenue over the next 10 years. But forcing GST on overseas online purchases is a notoriously complex thing to do. We wanted to ask the Minister Stuart Nash some questions, but he refused our request for an interview. His press secretary said he had front for a media conference this afternoon, but he never showed. And then his office promised a statement, but they never gave that to us either. The acting Prime Minister Calvin Davis was also unavailable for interviews today, so I asked the National Party spokesperson for Revenue, Judith Collins, for her assessment of Minister Nash's announcement. Well, he hasn't been able to follow it up with any details, so it tells me that Stuart's gone off on his own as usual. Um, it's certainly an issue that we've looked at in the past, and we were progressing. Um, but we also had the issue about whether or not uh, we continued with a boarded tariff, which is currently charged on a lot of goods, and whether or not that was fair to add that, uh, keep that in if we were putting on GST. So it's a little bit more complicated than probably Stuart Nash has worked out. And do you get the sense that he's, he's walking that back a bit? He, he didn't front media opportunities after this morning, and I, I see Grant Robertson um, the finance minister now saying that there's no definite timeline on this. Um, so do you think that they're having second thoughts? Well, I'd say that Stuart Nash has probably been told to um, back away a wee bit because there is actually a, a cost. Either you add the GST on and you keep the uh, current border tariffs in place or the administration costs or the inspection costs that uh, customs currently charge, in which case uh, we're asking New Zealanders to pay above what they should be paying or else you take those costs off and then you've got to, cast, uh, to fund customs for the work that they're doing when they're inspecting goods. And that's something which I would imagine uh, Stuart Nash hasn't thought of. One of what? the problems with not having cabinet committees operating, as the current government haven't, is that nobody's giving them that advice. Well let's see um, and look at that because I have looked back at a cabinet paper that Nikki Wagner when she was Minister of Customs got 
and it had a couple of examples in here and I can't work out exactly how they arrive at this but the officials seem to be saying that it wouldn't just be the extra 15% GST that you'd be paying you might even be um, incurring some other tariffs of, as well the officials give two examples shoes from the UK at $150 they say could increase to $209 which would be nearly a 40% increase clothing from the US at $100 as the example they give, could increase to 145, which would of course be a 45% increase. Can you tell me why this would be an increase over and above the 15% that you would expect if you started to add GST? Well, it would be unless you're going to fund customs separately or differently than what is currently done. So customs at the moment get the, they get to take and to keep uh, as their funding, part of their funding, the inspection costs that they actually have to undertake. So even though if you buy something in from, say, the UK, you think, well, OK, I'll have to pay GST on that in this uh, new regime, but you probably don't realise that that product also has to be inspected by customs to make sure it is actually what you say it is. And so that's something, when we got the advice on that, we thought, actually, we don't really want people to have to pay even more, um, but we do need to look at the funding around how we could do that with customs. So there was ongoing work, and that's one of the problems that Stuart Nash has got now, is he's gone straight in for the jugular, and he's forgotten there's a lot, there's another department, another ministry out there that actually needs to be taken care of. What about the equity issue here? Because the retailers will say this a lot. They'll say, you know, we're collecting um, revenue effectively for the government. Um, we have to compete against these online uh, providers from offshore, and it's simply not fair. Uh, that they don't uh, pay the GST and also means that the um, uh, New Zealand public loses out on the thick end of a couple of hundred million, it might even be more, of revenue that we'd quite like to spend on schools and hospitals and, and what have you. So what do you say to the justice argument here? Well, I think that they're absolutely correct and I feel um, a great deal of sympathy for those retailers, uh, land-based ones in New Zealand who are employing people. And that's why I think it is important that the issue is addressed. But you can't just address it in isolation as a GST issue. You've also got to address it as a government in terms of the funding for customs. So Grant Robertson's probably told Stuart Nash to keep quiet and to back down because suddenly he's seeing the fiscal hole is opening up again because they haven't counted on this cost that they obviously haven't even thought about. So that's Judith Collins, the National Party Revenue uh, spokesperson, as we did say. We asked Stuart Nash for an interview, but it was a, a no-go today. Returning to Zimbabwe now, where the military says its operations on the streets of the capital are not a takeover of the government and are designed to target criminals. Troops were deployed across Harare and seized the state broadcaster today after the President Robert Mugabe and his ruling party, ZANU-PF, accused the head of the military of treason. This has prompted speculation of a coup. There have been reports of explosions rocking the city centre and an unnamed officer in fatigues has spoken on national television in just the past hour. We wish to assure the nation that His Excellency the President of the Republic of Zimbabwe and Commander-in-Chief of the Zimbabwe Defence Forces Comrade Araji Mugabe and his family are safe and sound and their security is guaranteed. We are only targeting criminals around him who are committing crimes that are causing social and economic suffering in the country in order to bring them to justice. As soon as we have accomplished our mission, we expect that the situation will return to normalcy. Military officer speaking there. CNN's Fari Savenso, though, says things have been building up over the last few days and it's still unclear what it is the army is actually up to. Last week they fired the vice president, Emerson Munangagwa, who had been at Mugabe's side for most of, of, of his uh, working life. He was arrested, remember, in 1960 uh, for, for political activism at his local university. And at that stage, 
uh, of course, Mrs. Mugabe hadn't yet been born. And the military's gripe is that Mrs. Mugabe has now taken over the functions of the state. She, she has seen a meteoric rise to power way back to three years ago when she fired the other vice president, Joyce Mujuru, another war veteran, another uh, a stalwart of the liberation struggle. And they're saying this cannot go on. Now, there are two groups fighting for power in Zimbabwe. G40, which is led by Grace Mugabe and her faction. She has various followers, including Fisevia Kasukuere, Ignatius Chombo, the, the finance minister, and Jonathan Moyo, former minister of information. We do not know if these are the individuals the military is referring to, but certainly they are seen in the wider context of Zimbabwean political life as those very much behind Grace Mugabe. This news is being greeted uh, with a lot of jubilation, I must say, on social media in Zimbabwean circles. Um, we've been up, uh, the CNN team, in, both here in Nairobi and Johannesburg, following this story for the last four hours. And everything on social media is, is tense, but people are, seem to be very jubilant of the fact that this is now coming to a head. Something will be sorted out. Remember, uh, President Mugabe is 93 years old. For the last three years, no one has been quite able to tell whether he's in control of the country or whether his wife is. And now, the economic uh, implosion going on in the country with a certainly uh, uncertainty, this seems to be a move that may propel change. As Fari Servenso reporting there on the situation in Zimbabwe. Stuart Nash has got in touch. I'm not sure whether he's watching or listening tonight. 6.26, this one came through. We've been waiting all day for this. What does it say? This is on GST and the government's moves to charge GST on things that you buy online from international retailers. He's, so he's issued a statement saying the government is committed to making the New Zealand tax system fairer for all New Zealanders and that the government is working, or uh, well, the government's tax working group will also look at GST online goods and services as this is also a fairness issue. He says that work is underway on this issue and will be incorporated into the tax working group's consideration. So that's interesting, isn't it? The tax working group will look at this issue, he says, and it will. Uh, they will be looking at uh, the ends to make an early recommendation on this matter as appropriate. So thank you, Minister, and thank you to all of you for listening and watching this evening. That's Checkpoint. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. The Wellington train operator Transdev has ruled out any chance of tomorrow's 24-hour rail strike starting at 2 in the morning being averted. In Australia, legislation to legalise same-sex marriage is likely to be introduced today after an overwhelming yes vote. The police have arrested a 41-year-old man over the death of Auckland mother Arishma Chand on Sunday. Zimbabwe's military says its operations on the streets of the capital are not a 